Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Nick Jones, a professor in the Department of Justice Studies and the Associate Dean of the Faculty of Arts. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's presentation of the 2019 Stapleford Lecture. As we begin tonight's event, I'd like to acknowledge our presence here at the University of Regina on Treaty 4 lands, the territories of the Nehiyawak, the Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. We are grateful to be here. Each winter, the Faculty of Arts is pleased to present the annual Stapleford Lecture. Funded through the generosity of Ernest William Stapleford and Maud Bunting Stapleford Lecture Fund, this endowed trust was established by the late Elsie Stapleford in memory of her parents. Elsie's father, the Reverend Ernest Stapleford, was the second president of Regina College, then a campus of the University of Saskatchewan. He is widely considered to be a formative president of this institution for laying the groundwork for Regina College's transformation into the University of Regina. As an intellectual, an activist, and a great supporter of the arts, Maud Bunting Stapleford was extremely active in public life. She was an influential voice for expanding the legal rights for women and children, and was involved in various organizations campaigning for legislative reforms. Like her mother, Dr. Elsie Stapleford was also a great advocate of children's rights. One of her lasting achievements was helping to create and implement the 1946 Ontario Day Nurseries Act, which served to provide government funding to day nurseries and nursery schools, ensuring standards of care and licensing requirements, which in turn helped transform the regulation and delivery of childcare in Canada. The generosity of the Stapleford Memorial Endowment allows the University of Regina Faculty of Arts to present an annual lecture in the areas that the Stapleford family were actively engaged. Justice, the status of women, the education and care of children, the rights of the disadvantaged, and the history and art of Saskatchewan. Past lecturers have included Zara Nawaz, creator of the CBC hit series Little Mosque on the Prairie, Perry Bellegarde, National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, and Maclean's Magazine and Globe and Mail investigative reporter, Nancy MacDonald. We are thrilled to include tonight's Stapleford lecturer, Dr. Nancy Hansen, in this list of esteemed guest speakers. At this time, I would also like to acknowledge Bill and Leanne McLean, friends of the Staplefords. Thank you for coming. I would now like to take the opportunity to invite Danica Bilal to provide an introduction for Dr. Hansen. Good evening, so nice to see so many people out tonight. So I am Dr. Danika Belial, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of History and a member of the Stapleford Lecture Committee. So I had the great honor of helping to select the lecturer that we have here this evening. Dr. Nancy Hansen is an associate professor and director of the Interdisciplinary Master's Program in Disability Studies at the University of Manitoba where her research areas include disability in spaces of culture education, literacy social policy, employment healthcare access, the experiences of disabled and LGBTQ communities in post-conflict areas, the history of disability and Nazi eugenics, work for which she has received an Einstein Research Fellowship, which she was just telling me about she fulfilled in Germany. She is the author of multiple book chapters and academic articles and has been published in Disability Studies Quarterly, the Review of Disability Studies, and the Canadian Journal of Women and the Law, among several international journals. She's the co-editor of the 2018 book, Untold Stories, a Canadian Disability History Reader, which I should note is the first, uh, one of the first art, uh, edited collections in Canadian history on disability. And she's also a co-editor of 217 book, The Rutledge History of Disability, which is a global history of disability studies. Dr. Hansen is former president of the Canadian Disability Studies Association, a former member of the Canadian Association of University Teachers Working Group, Academics with Disabilities and Equity Committee, and a recent recipient of the Rotary Paul Harris Fellowship. So for all of these reasons and many more, we are thrilled to welcome her here tonight, where 
to share her research and her insights into the history of disability and art, and the ways disabled artists, thinkers, activists, and allies are reinventing the cultural and artistic landscapes. Please welcome Dr. Nancy Hansen. Thank you so much. It is a great honor for me to be chosen as a guest speaker for the 2019 Stapleford Lecture. I am truly humbled by the gracious invitation extended to me by the University of Regina, the Stapleton um, Committee, uh, the Stapleford Committee, excuse me, uh, uh, Dean Rick Clear, Associate Dean Nick Jones, the Faculty of Arts of the University of Regina. I'm nervous, can you tell? Um, and I would especially like to, like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Malegros Chagas, um, who made all the travel, accommodation, and access arrangements for me. I'm a human geographer interested in art. I am not an artist, but art has been transformative for me. So to be included in such illustrious company is daunting and somewhat overwhelming. Nonetheless, I am thrilled and I thank you. I was asked to talk about the intersection of art and disability. The reality is art and disability have always intersected. However, how and whether or not um, how and whether or not this is done is another matter entirely. We are the world's largest minority. Disabled people comprise 1.3 billion people worldwide. However, we remain largely invisible. The relationship between art, uh, disability art and culture is complicated. In many ways, the larger society remains somewhat conflicted in determining where exactly disability fits in the cultural artistic landscape. As a result, disability is largely absent and invisible in this domain. When disability is presented, we disabled people often find ourselves caught amongst conflicting narratives focusing on the therapeutic benefits of artistic engagement and or the inspirational nature of the disabled artist and their artistry neither of which may be appropriate. Discourse such as, as this is endemic in the um, corrective condescension, prominent in the traditional medicalized ableist understanding uh, which permeates the dominant um, social cultural understanding of disability. However, this master trope is slowly shifting and these are interesting and exciting times for disabled people, scholars, allies, and constituents alike. We find ourselves in the midst of an ongoing cultural recovery project, discovering, uncovering, and creating, and reshaping the artistic landscape in a very different way. This paper traces the journey from artistic absence to activism. Disability has always been present in society and it has always been present in culture. However, disabled people have had little say in how this is depicted or portrayed. Art and disability have been framed largely in terms of rehabilitative and therapeutic value for disabled people. And indeed, until recently, typing the words art and disability into a search engine would result in a series of articles exploring this concept. Um, is, the, is that the first slide or is there one before that? Oops, Oops. okay. I'm, I'm going, I'm, I missed one. I missed, you're at the right slide, I'm ahead of myself. That's how sometimes disabled people are portrayed in art and that's a very early example. Okay, you're, you're right on cue, I'm not. So if we can just go to the next slide, that would be great. So. Uh, um, and that's not to say art therapy isn't a bad thing. Uh, however, we just want to explore a different way of, of looking at things. I propose adopting a very different disability perspective, examining connections and intersections uh, between a disability and art in a positive, proactive manner. And hopefully it will be refreshing. How do we get here? Anyway, the yuck factor. 
Western society has yet to develop a comfort level with um, the diverse messiness that constitutes um, uh, and functional uh, diversity that constitutes the richness of humanity. We as a society often f find this discomfort manifested in the many negative associations still attached to our understanding of disability. It is often linked to language that stresses the so-called ugliness or defectiveness. Common phrases in usage often reflect this. Stricken with, afflicted by, suffering from, and uh, these are but a few of the uh, using, uh, using phrases that are usually in, in common usage. There are indeed some phrases that have worked to remove the word disability itself from the language. Physically challenged, special needs. We must ask ourselves, what are these words codes for? Good enough? Better than nothing? Who do they protect? It would seem that human disability, the mere presence of it as well as its representation, somehow disturbs the natural cultural natural, quote unquote, um, cultural aesthetic for public space. You see, I have to work my human geography thing in here. Um, in public space, indeed, um, the so-called ugly laws, if I could have the next, oh, you're there already, that's good. Um, <laughs> ugly laws passed in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century in large North American cities were guard to keeping the unsightly read disability out of public space and in their place so as not to offend public sensibilities. It's important to remember that these laws were in place in various jurisdictions up until the mid-1970s. Um, a modern example of this phenomenon is illustrated by the controversy that surrounded, if we can have the next slide please, um, see, I'm finally getting up to speed here. Um, Mark, uh, that surrounded Mark Quinn's uh, Alison Lapper pregnant, the uh, sculptor of a pregnant artist with a disability. Lapper was born without arms. It was exhibited on the fourth plinth in, uh, on a concrete platform in Trafalgar Square, London. And there was a huge controversy as to whether this type of art should be in such a prominent space on public display. Galleries and museums are, most of, uh, are often the reflection and guardian of what is important. Cultural spaces such as these play a vital role in determining both what is culturally valued and worthy of preservation and exhibition. They determine what belongs and more importantly, what does not. Curators can have a highly selective, can be highly selective regarding what is remembered, recorded, or displayed, as well as the manner in which it is presented. Whereas progress has been made by curators incorporating richer accounts of marginalized populations within museum collections with regard to issues of race, gender, and indigeneity, Disability has yet to be viewed along the same identity continuum and therefore represented with the same care. Charged with, what is, uh, with safeguarding what is finest, the primary focus of disability and museums, in museums and art galleries is usually limited to physical access issues. For example, wheelchair ramps, elevators, accessible toilets, and eating areas. I'm told on a regular basis, yes, we're accessible, we have ramps, we have toilets, and we have great restaurants. Um, there has been some progress made in institutions developing touchable, can we have the next slide, please? Um, touchable installations and exhibits for uh, individuals with vision impairment. However, there is little understanding um, of disabled people's actual place within culture, perhaps because there is a perception of risk 
of offending the public in dealing with what some may consider a difficult subject. Shifting perspective through a disability lens. The cultural landscape is slowly shifting and through a disability lens is putting disability back into the picture even though it has always been there. Many of Western culture's most revered artists have some form of disability or impairment. Could we have the next slide, please? Uh, Van Gogh with epilepsy and mental health issues. Henry Toulouse-Lautrec, next slide, please. Um, short stature. Um, Claude Monet, uh, if you could show the next slide, please. Um, and Auguste Renoir had vision impairments. Indeed, numerous writers now postulate that the art, uh, artist's unique artistic perspective was to a significant degree impacted by their vision impairments. If you want to um, push the next slide, please. Is it there? Okay, great. Um, and uh, let's see, Henry Matisse, who became a wheelchair user in later life, and as a result had to develop a new way of artistic expression, began to use paper and cutting it in different ways. And in this process, he called it his second life. If we want to move to the next slide, please. And the one after. Yeah, thank you. Um, Maude Lewis, famous Canadian folk artist with rheumatoid arthritis, used the spaces and places closest to her for art, her artistic expression. Oh, oh, I missed Frida, sorry. I have to go back. I missed Frida. Frida Kahlo with spina bifida and an amputee. Maude Lewis, the famous Canadian folk artist with rheumatoid arthritis. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, used the spaces and places closest to her for her artistic expression. However, with the exception of Kahlo, who openly wrote and illustrated her disability, for the most part, this aspect of their lives has been expunged through a form of social cultural erasure. Is there a picture for Frida after that? I'm not sure. Yep, good. See, there's Frida. She's um, holding the brace that she used, and she's depicting one of the surgeries she had right there. So um, it is if their disability is um, recognized or uh, shown that their skill or status is somehow diminished. It, uh, and it is presented usually as something tragic or pathetic rather than uh, an amazing opportunity for creativity and to add greater depth to their work. Cultural representations of disability or lack thereof have a direct impact on how disability is understood and perceived by the mainstream. Nevertheless, the richness and texture of disability um, of the disability community is arguably absent from the vast majority of these representations, just as gender, race, and sexual orientation are now sources of cultural pride, so too is disability. Uh, disability pride is coming to the fore, and through this, understanding of disability is slowly changing. There is, however, there is still a level of, of unease. At present, a uh, few galleries and museums show the experience of disabled people, and there is a high level of uneasiness associated with impairment. And curators often um, believe that they are in a difficult position, caught between fear of insult and treating disability as objectification. If we can, oh, my favorite picture, thank you. Um, for an example of this is the Lowry uh, in uh, Manchester, England. The 
managers at the Lowry are very uh, weary of some of the collection that they have. They hold uh, the major work of L.S. Lowry, who um, uh, was a, an artist between uh, the early 20th century and mid to late 20th century. He died in 1976. And he did a lot around uh, industrialization in the north of England, depicting everyday life. However, one of his pictures is called The Cripples, as you can see here. And the, um, uh, the uh, managers are very reluctant to have giftware depicting the cripples or prints depicting the cripples for fear of being labeled insensitive. I came across the cripples quite by accident on a sightseeing visit to the Lowry. I was actually killing time between uh, when a conference began and when it was my time to present. And when I went there, I had no idea the cripples were there. However, it was love at first sight. It was the first time I'd seen my peeps in a, in a gallery. It was the first time I felt like I belonged and like um, that I, I wasn't on the outside looking in. And it was fantastic and incredibly liberating. I can't, I can't even begin to tell you. And as a matter of fact, it now graces the cover of the Rutledge History of Disability. I'm sorry, I couldn't help the self-promotion there. Um, uh, and um, however, unfortunately, many art critics do not share my enthusiasm. Ableist language permeates the mainstream discourse in, in subtle and not so subtle ways surrounding this um, painting. Uh, in, uh, in an article, um, Diagnosis of Art, Lowry's Cripples, it was written in 2007, the author spends the bulk of his time trying to figure out the disability that most of the, most of the individuals have depicted in that in that painting. And um, he talks about underlying pathologies and he goes through guessing who has what. And um, he goes, um, of course, the point of Lowry's painting, this is a quote, of course, the point, uh, of course, the point of Lowry's painting is not what the cripples are suffering from, but their very existence in a way uh, which the healthy onlookers, mostly children, gaze at them with curiosity. Um, the author um, talks about the fact that um, Lowry himself, quote, may have suffered from Asperger's syndrome. Here he is depicted um, lost in thought. And apparently, if you can see, Back there, there's a man walking a very tiny dog, right? A very tiny black dog. Some people think that's Lowry in his picture, okay? Um, so, and then uh, at the Tate Gallery, the, Ottawa, the audio guide in the Tate Gallery London wasn't much better. He, and this is a quote, he comes close to the human world now and when he comes close, it's to a human world that is dreadful, deformed, a world of victims, if you like. Although these victims have energy, they're not going to take it lying down, you know. They're going to, uh, to live in spite of everything that the world does to them. Um, and he goes on. It, uh, it has a sort of deliberate comic grotesqueness to it. I'm not sure if it managed to, to strike a real moral balance. Here's a side of me which recoils from this. It may be glib in its pessimism, but it is part of Lowry. His, he is always saying no sentiment, right? That is his watchword, no sentiment. He is going to look at the world as it is, and the world includes misery and deformity. So uplifting, you know, it just, it just, it's lovely. 
Um, and finally, the teacher's pack for the Lowry itself has some interesting things to say. This, this is a quote. This type of painting has proved unpopular with many people. This painting was often considered distasteful, cruel, and repulsive. Again, it just gets you. <laughs> so, but at the ground level, there's a much different story. One of, the, one of the gallery guides, he tells me he has a disability, says that uh, the area around the cripples is his, his favorite because of the sense of humor of, of, the, of the painting. He finds, it, he finds it to be a very positive experience as well. And patrons of the gallery are encouraged to um, leave sticky papers uh, as they leave the gallery and they say, apparently, the Cripples is one of the more popular paintings, right? So what do the, what do the critics really know? Um, so there are comments here, like, um, it says, my favorite painting was the Cripples. Everyone in the picture has some kind of deformation or imperfection, imperfectly perfect, just like all of us. Another one said, I like the Cripples because it made me smile. And still another, I love the cripples as I am disabled myself. Okay. So, um, let's see, where am I going here? Okay, yeah. I may be slightly out of order, but just bear with me. Um, the purpose here is to work on creating a new understanding of disabled people's um, place in cultural space and reframing the traditional cultural narrative. Venus de Milo, for example, what we hold as the traditional aspirational beauty is armless, yet she's never portrayed as having a disability. We are, we are working toward uh, a new emphasis on dignity and human worth. Cultural representation can be a, a representation of reflection and acceptance and lead to uh, wider social rights. It would seem as portrayals of disability change, perceptions of disability gradually transform um, the un and the understanding of human difference shifts along with ways of seeing and understanding. And this in turn reshapes uh, the social narrative of disability and disability rights. If we can go to the next slide. See, there's, there's Venus. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, here's where I'm a bit out of order, so just bear with me for a second. Um, in cultural settings, reference is made to impairment. It, it is usually incidental. Consider, for example, this reductionist approach to impairment, the treatment by the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum of Samson Togud Rosh, who is arguably one of the finest miniaturists of the late 18th and early 19th century. He was an Irishman who was, one of his works is there. Uh, and um, he was a, a fine watercolorist and miniaturist. Um, and I went through um, the exhibit one of the times I was in Belfast. And if we want to go to the next, okay. This is what was written in the catalog. Um, as he was deaf, Rush would not have been able to enjoy the sound of the pipes, but this wonderful, uh, this wonderful painting, he certainly captures the immediacy of the scene that confronted him. This is the only reference made to Rush's deafness in the exhibit, and it is presented in a rather frivolous manner. Only his uh, inability to hear music is negatively reflected upon, and the overarching social cultural uh, dissonance is present in the description. I would argue that his deafness enabled him to be hyper aware of his environment and enhanced his ability to focus on the most min minute detail. And as a result, his work is. Um, is one of the few examples of uh, late, early 18th century, late um, 
early uh, 19th century, late 18th century life in Ireland. No longer content to be absent citizens on the, on the cultural landscape, um, disabled people are laying claim to the cultural spaces on their own terms. We disabled people and our allies are providing needed substantive context to these items which we encounter daily. And we are starting and rebuilding from the ground up. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? And you can see how things are, are changing. You can go to the next slide, please. One of the first people to do this is Frida Kahlo. And when you consider she died in 1956, she she owned her disability. She was proud of what, like, look at the artistic depiction there. I think it's so cool. She's owning it, she's not hiding it. It's, and it's art and culture in, in the finest form. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. And here again, we see Frida decorated the corset she used on a regular basis. Okay, that's, you can go to the next slide, please. Oops. We can just go back for a second. Just ignore me. I obviously don't know what I'm doing. Okay. And, and um, in the earlier picture of Frida, there is her face. And she wears a lot of makeup and um, earrings and her unibrow, as people may know. And she also wore um, long skirts. And there are some people that think she wore the long skirts to cover up her disability. However, I think she, she wore those things to, uh, to, and used her face and unique ways of expression of fo focusing attention where she wanted to be focused. It wasn't a question of her covering up or being ashamed of what she did. She just wanted to um, keep control of the situation on her terms. And, and um, that's not to say her disability wasn't difficult, but she was going to own it and she was going to do it the way she saw best, which I think is really cool when you think of uh, somebody that died 63 years ago. Okay. So, how's this impacted on me? been kind of interesting. My crutches here, you can go to the next slide please. My crutches and here. Um, I have to tell you about them because um, I initially came about, they came about quite by accident. Um, the artist whose name is Diane Dreger, who I now teach with, she also teaches in disability studies and she has a disability herself. Um, she had just launched a, a journal, uh, a special journal on uh, disability and art. And we got to talking about how boring um, assistive devices usually are. And I said, could you, could you paint some up for me because I am that shallow. I wanted to coordinate all my fashion stuff, right? That was it. I mean, I had no, no uh, finer uh, thing to do at that point in time. But she said to me, Nancy, how would you like to make a real fashion statement? So I, have, I now have these crutches. And when she bought them, for, they're done in what's called a graffiti style. They're black and red, and they have all kinds of uh, anti ableist sayings on them, vegetables of the world unite, ignorance is not bliss, human rights, compassion, anything you, it's written there, but uh, they don't come out very often because as it's commissioned art, I don't want them to fade away and they're 10 years old as it is right now. So when Diane brought them to me, like she came over to the house and we saw them for the first time, I cried because I was so excited and happy because how I felt on the inside about being a disabled woman was finally reflected on the outside. And a strange thing happened to me too. I noticed when I wore these crutches out in public spaces, nobody said, what's wrong with you? 
Like total strangers have an interesting habit of coming up and asking disabled people the most intrusive questions, you know? But it never happened with, people would come up to me and say, those are cool. I'd be going through the airport and going through security and my crutches would be going through the x-ray machine and the guys would be reading them on the way by. And I'd be standing, I'd be standing in an elevator and people would be looking me up and down, but not in the usual way. They'd be reading what was on the crutches. So I thought, this was really cool, you know? And it sort of worked into some teachable moments, right? Which was kind of neat. And as a result, because I'm an academic, Diane and I wrote a paper on this whole thing because we're both academics. Um, the, the, the cultural shift is, uh, is echoed in a much broader spectrum. If you can go to the next. Yes, I'm back on track again. That's so nice. Um, and the, the process and cultural shift is echoed on a much broader spectrum in the award-winning British multimedia exhibition um, entitled Reframing Disability Portraits from the Royal College. And what's really cool about this is from the uh, Britain's Royal College of Physicians. They have a collection, nobody knows where they came from, but they have a collection of portraits of disabled people from past centuries. But what was interesting in the way they did this, they got, they involve, uh, directly involved uh, a a group of disabled activists, scholars, and, and uh, cons various constituency members to give them their analysis of the pictures. So they were directly involved in this, and um, it was totally reframing disability. And um, they uncovered information about these individuals and the lives they led as much as they could. And it was a very positive thing, because you have to remember that back in the day, disability happened a lot because life was hard, tragic, and short. And disability, it may have been accepted, but it was around a lot, okay? So um, they adopted a, a social environmental perspective rather than a medicalized one. Like nobody was sitting around trying to determine what was wrong with this particular individual. And as, as a point of interest, I digress slightly, that individual uh, gave birth to countless numbers of children, was very, was very rich in his life, and had several wives throughout his lifetime. So he didn't do too badly. He wasn't the, it wasn't the traditional life of a disabled person at that time, but it just goes to show that the people were, were managing okay. And at the end of this, and I didn't include a clip because I couldn't get the, the pictures to show properly, but the disabled activists and consultants in this had their pictures taken on their own terms, and they took the pictures, and they decided how they wanted it shown. And uh, uh, let's see, another example, I don't, is there another picture after that? Okay, okay, so we're, I'm still on track here. Um, and it's, it's so, what, I wanna go back for a second and, and we don't have to go back to the picture, but I just want to talk about the fact that the, a most highly medicalized agency was working in partnership, real partnership with disabled people looking at things from a social perspective. So it just goes to show that the medical perspective and the social justice perspective can work together, which was cool. Um, okay. Through this practice, uh, a person who was formerly a, a, a subject of a, uh, objectification is re relocated to a position of pride, power, and most importantly, control, okay? Another example, more recent example, is something that started out as a, a summer project for a group of third year university students at, in Ryerson's uh, Disability Studies Program. They were asked to collect um, uh, various pieces of, of um, disability culture um, ranging from adapted shovels to uh, intelligence test 
back uh, from back in the day, and um, a trunk that depicted what uh, a young child might have taken with him to an institution, and um, other things were the first example of a portable ventilator and um, one, uh, a braille watch that was owned by one of the first blind teachers in the province of Ontario, just to name a few. And uh, using these materials was uh, was representative of the disability experience in Canada. And that display is now uh, on permanent display at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg. That's not a, I'm not a paid commercial spokesperson, by the way. Um, finally, um, there is the Freedom Tour, which was a joint project between the NFB and People First Canada. And the film itself records the efforts of People First members and their allies to lobby provincial governments across Western Canada to close the remaining provincial institutions to enable residents to live in the community. It is hard, uh, grinding reality of institutional life and it's documented. I have to give another plug here. One of the co-producers of the film is a, is a graduate of the Disability Studies program in um, Manitoba. Um, so they used archival photos, film clips, and exterior shots because they weren't allowed inside. So there, uh, and changes have resulted because of the film. Um, and they talked, uh, the creators of the film talked about their deeply personal experiences in institutional treatment. And as I said, the film has had an impact in helping to close or getting uh, legislators to think about closing these institutions. It's a challenging road ahead. The existing cultural narrative around disability is slowly changing. The Freedom Tour and Out From Under are, are and the uh, cultural reclamation of everyday items are, is slowly um, reshifting uh, re the narrative. Um, together, they illustrate a profound willed and representational shift driven in large measure by people with disabilities and their allies. Art galleries and museums can play a pivotal role in presenting and understanding the manner of differences and changes, the shaping and reshaping of the cultural comfort zone surrounding disability and disability rights in cultural spaces. It has begun, um, but through strong partnerships and substantive commitment and a genuine desire, uh, the journey ahead now seems much less daunting. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. Um, on, a, on a personal note, I've enjoyed our travel in the car and our lunch today, and it's been a real pleasure um, getting to meet you, and thank, thank you for bringing this important topic to us. Um, at this time, we'd like to open it up to the audience. If there's any questions for, for Nancy, um, please feel free. What got me started in activism? Well, I've had disability my entire life, so if I wanted to get anything done, I had to sort of advocate. So I've been advocating for, shall we say, a number of decades now. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. As someone who's going to be a future educator, future teacher, what kind of language do you think is the best uh, to be used as a teacher for students? Okay. This is my personal thing, but I'll say it now. Never under any circumstances ever use the term special needs. Okay, because these are, these are what, we, what we require to get the job done. There's nothing special about them. It's just what the devices we need 
to participate as fully as we possibly can. I would say that be, be open, be, I, I know this isn't quite what you're asking me, but be open, be creative, and be flexible. And, and don't be driven by a, a diagnosis on a page. That can be a, a marker point, but look for potential as opposed to deficit and see how you can be a, a positive uh, partner in this, in this individual's educational journey. I can count on the fingers of one hand the the educators I had in my life that were a positive influence on me. And without them, I wouldn't be speaking here now. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Well, um, if I had two of me, what I'd like to do is maybe go have the opportunity to look at the collections that, because I'm not an art historian or an artist, right? But I'd love to go through and unpack some of the collections that are already in, uh, in the collections of various galleries and museums because um, disability and disabled people are already there. It's just, it's just a question of unpacking everything. So that's what I'd like to do: some unpacking, some cultural unpacking. Well, it's um, a very good friend of mine um, uh, at the University uh, of Manitoba, Vanessa, whose last name escapes me right now because I'm nervous. Um, she's in Victorian literature, and she's gone through and she's looked at a lot of um, 18th, uh, 19th century blind artists and writers. And um, also, uh, um, which is really interesting, and uh, Diane Dreger, who, who is an artist, she's also a poet, and um, she's sort of a Renaissance woman, what can I say? She's done a lot of uh, parallels in writing uh, with uh, writing around the experiences of Frida Kahlo uh, and uh, Florence Nightingale, for example, and um, uh, various other 18th and 19th century artists who, and writers who themselves uh, experienced uh, disability. Like um, Dar Darwin, for example, took so long to write The Origin of the Species because he had um, uh, it, uh, a disease, uh, they think it's colitis, but it, it robbed him of a lot of energy, so it took him a decade to write what he did. And uh, so she, she's gone and dug up a lot of stuff around um, writers and artists and their experience with disability. And there's a lot of collections. Now, there's another collection that's coming out of, uh, of disabled writers, modern disabled writers, writing about their experience. So it's there. I'd be, if you give me your contact details or contact me, I'd be more than willing to send you some information. By the way, Vanessa's last name is Warren. I remember now. <laughs> OK, yes. Well, I'll tell you why, because um, I, I did my, why there's, there's a debate around the whole thing. I don't really care. As long as we're having the conversation, I don't care, um, because I, I think it's important to have the conversation rather than to get caught up in semantics, right? But this is, this is my take on it. Um, the, the disability constituency in, 
in Britain, where I did a lot of my, I did my PhD at the University of Glasgow. So, um, and the disability community in Britain says disabled people because they want to own it. I'm comfortable with with um, the term disabled people. However, in North America, they want to use people first language. I don't really, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. I think if we, in my personal perspective, we should spend more time working on inclusion rather than the language we're going to use to talk about inclusion. I like to get down to substantive inclusion. I still spend my time wondering where are there are places, probably this is too much, where there are places I can actually use a toilet. I'd like to be able to move beyond that, you know? I think people get caught up too, too much in being afraid of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing, so consequently nothing gets done. I would rather that there's substantive action being taken rather than a name change here or there. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and we're we're here in, in Saskatchewan, and um, in the last uh, number of years, we've had uh, some you know great opportunity and success in developing work and having it shown um, here and and a little bit provincially. But one of the things we've come up um, uh, against now is. At first, uh, my, my disabilities are visible, so... I'm Most like, people's are. Right. Yeah. So I'm like the patron saint of the company because I'm getting all these people out. Yeah. That's one of the things that's very common. Yes, yes. Uh, but moreover, um, the, the, uh, more, the, the recent challenge is, is that we were, we were very loved uh, when we were behaving quite well. <laughs> Threatening. Yeah. Um, and and as the artists grow and, and the desire to really cultivate. Um, yeah. Nobody likes an uppity crip, though. You know, right. we're supposed to be passive, compliant, and chronically yeah. grateful. So we don't. We, I shouldn't say we don't know. But really curious for a number of reasons, like um, you know, suggestions from you relative to addressing this in a um, way that continues to keep the conversations open, especially with funders and funding agents. Oh, yes. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. 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 We, we recently, like just to give you a little idea, we recently, last year, one of the company members is here, but very recently, um, we, were, we were legitimately told that disability wasn't a culture from our cultural representatives. <laughs> so, oh. of course, we had a whole bunch of opportunity to start sending information forward and getting into the office to have conversation. Yeah. But there is a fairly um, great misunderstanding. Yes. Ableism is a pervasive thing. Yeah. And you just have to keep you just have to keep pushing. I'll give you an example of what happened to me last week. I was dealing with a funding agency that shall remain nameless. Um, and um, I, when we had our face to face meeting they said because uh, my my co uh, colleagues and myself were initially refused this funding. Uh, one of the reasons was because disabled people are naturally passive and incapable of advocating for themselves. So I had a rather full and frank discussion with the individuals involved. I didn't lose my temper. I was just, you know, firm. Um, and they reversed their decision. All I can say is keep educating people because the responses you're getting are based in a lack of education, a lack of awareness, and a lack of knowledge in the subject area. So I, I know it doesn't necessarily help for the situation, but uh, you have to keep pushing. And there are ways of pushing without being threatening, but just because they're not comfortable with what you're saying doesn't mean you shouldn't be saying it. Because we have to start getting uncomfortable to get things to change, right? Of course. So for yourself um, or um, people um, in your community, so we've, we've, we're doing that. 
that we're not stopping. Yeah. We're, we're going yeah. Um, forward, meeting with firmness, all of that stuff. We also um, have uh, some uh, younger uh, company members who are quite disheartened, and not only that, but become um, it becomes difficult to sustain health mm -hmm. within the constant. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's hard. Well, all you can do, I would say, is keep doing what you're doing and uh, keep, well, go back to, like, this stuff doesn't, I know this sounds like cliche, but it doesn't happen overnight. Just being present makes a difference, right? You get people thinking. And even though you, they're not successful every time, you're still there. And uh, your presence changes, changes the cultural landscape in some way. See, I have to bring the human geography thing back. But I mean, it's really important. And I, I know it's, it's a tough time to deal with stuff like this right now. But you have to keep doing it. And I have to keep telling myself that too. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm a company member. <laughs> Hi, company member. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, this is all to say, um, in your experience as an academic, because I, uh, I have two lovely supervisors, but I am consistently bumping up against what I would call like the white cube ableism of the art world. Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering what uh, movement you've seen as an, as a, an academic in civil academics. Well, the fact that I'm on this side of the desk is nothing short of miraculous. Um, because the academy is not one of the most, um, um, I could, the lightning could strike at any moment. Um, <laughs> the academy is not one of the most accepting places in the world, despite what one would like one to think. But um, again, it comes down to being present, and things are shifting because disabled academics are um, uh, working to make change. Now, it's fine for those of us that have tenure, but for those of us that don't, it's a, the, the academy doesn't seem like an overly safe place to, to do a lot of advocacy, but um, it is changing, and I would say in very positive ways, but it's not changing quickly. It's the academy after all. So. Okay. I would get allies. Get uh, talk to people um, outside your discipline, inside your discipline, who get it, who you don't have to explain it all to, but who naturally get it, like the people in this room, for example. So I would I would cultivate allies because you shouldn't have to do it all on your own. I don't. And I, I, I talk to people everywhere. And like, you know, a lot of people want to share information. Other marginalized groups, there's, you, can, you can get more accomplished in a coalition. Sometimes uh, issues are um, specific to one group, but we all share the same, we all show the same kind, of, we all want the same outcome, right? We all want um, equality, dignity, and respect. And anywhere you can cultivate that, I would say go for it. So work on getting some outlets because you don't have to do it on your own. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I can bug with one more question. Sure. You talked about the, this theme of object, ob objectivism almost, or um, um, the way... Uh, the, uh, disabled people are objectified a lot, right? Yeah. Well, like for example, um, uh, the the you mentioned the freak show earlier. That's an example. But at the same time, a lot of people who were so-called freaks were very. When you're barred from so many occupations, and that's the one that's left, you that's your expertise, and you you use that in the way that you can, right? But uh, there's been a lot of 
uh, looking at uh, disability as some kind of aberrant something rather than the uniqueness that is naturally human, human nature, right? So it's, it's about shifting the lens from being an object of curiosity, right, to somebody who is included in society as a whole. So we're changing the way that, that we're perceived and the, the way we're looked at. I mean, there are now, there are now disabled models in the, in, in the fashion industry. Um, there are uh, fashion designers who are um, designing adaptable clothing. There are, um, there are disabled photographers. There's a lot of, there's a lot, uh, there's this, stuff going around on Twitter about um, uh, disability is hot. So there's a lot of pictures of uh, disabled people projecting themselves in their own way and on their own terms. I think that's the key. If uh, the people directly involved have, have a substantive say in the way that they're being depicted, where we have to work on is, is, is um, Hollywood. And having disabled actors, because there are lots of disabled actors, playing the parts of disabled people. Because in my view, it's, you wouldn't have an Al Jolson approach these days for any other, everybody know who Al Jolson, okay. Al Jolson in the 1920s, you see, I know I'm using dated analogies. Um, Al Jolson used to do blackface in the early 1920s and 30s. And you wouldn't have uh, that portrayal for somebody of a racialized minority. And so you shouldn't have somebody faking disability on screen. So I think that's where some work has to be done. But since the Academy just did their first all black, all black um, action uh, feature film in Black Panther, I think we have a ways to go yet. But that's not saying it's not worth doing. Anybody else? Or is that it? Oh. I have a friend who was involved in a crop duster accident. Mm-hmm. He's in a wheelchair and a friend of his said to him, you're not disabled, you just can't walk. Exactly. Exactly. why is life like that? I don't know. Uh, people have to learn. Uh, look at things as potential, and, and that's not to dismiss disability because there are things that you really have to deal with. But it's all in a question of how you approach them in the first place, and the support mechanisms you have to get you there along the way, right? But a lot of the time we spend we spend so much time working on the basic necessities of life that it's really hard to get into the other stuff. So it'd be great to be able to get into the other stuff. Well, thank you very much. Well, on behalf of the Faculty of Arts, I'd like to conclude tonight's event by expressing my gratitude to Nancy for her presentation of tonight's Stapleford Lecture. Thank you, Nancy, for this insightful conversation about disability and the crucial role of disabled artists and allies in creating and interrogating art and culture. Our thanks, of course, also go to Ernest William Stapleford and Maud Bunting Stapleford Lecture Fund for enabling tonight's lecture. And to the Stapleford Committee, Donica, Chris, and Bridget, supported as always by the work of Milagros. Lastly, thank you all for coming to tonight's presentation and have a wonderful night.